how would you define the elements of a perfect summer movie? And has it changed from your childhood to now? It has to make you want to be in that world. Mm -hmm. And you can see a good movie that's not, that, that's a great story or anything, but unless you really want to be in it, that's what's a really, and that's easier when you're a kid probably. And so the, you know, does it change as you become an adult? The best ones, there's something in there for the adults too, I guess, you know? Um, I'd also that. add, I think that uh, a great summer movie has got to have an emotional experience at the core of it. You know, when you were six years old, seven years old, you go to see Star Wars for the first time, and, you know, there's that moment, Luke's on Tatooine, he's looking out, you know, and it just, it, it grabs you. When, when Obi-Wan dies, it grabs you. And, you know, if you, you look at the, the great films of like the 70s and 80s, the great summer films, they had that emotional experience. And I think that uh, as an adult, you crave that too, but you experience those things differently. The things you relate to change. John, is it different in animation? I mean, do you feel like, obviously there's a slightly different set of rules there when you're putting together a huge well, they take so long that, first of all, you don't really know it's a summer movie because you get four years of so spring, fall, summer, you're going through, you're going through, you're making it sort of independently of when it's going to come out. And with DreamWorks, when we make two movies a year, maybe three, they all have to do all these things, whether it comes out in November or March. So I think it's, it's true of any great movie that it's going to have all those elements. It's just that summer is the time when... You, as a culture, we sort of come to expect that and want that. And each weekend, we want to go to the movie theater and sit in the nice air conditioning and have that experience. And I think it's, it's probably, for me, it feels like it's in the last 10 years that this has really become a thing, an event, where when I was a kid and I went to these movies, I have no recollection of when I went to see them. But now I think kids really feel like, oh, it's summer, I'm not in school. I'm going to see one of these movies this weekend. Um, how do you, uh, when you're working in an environment where you're, where you're up, you're sort of competing in a sense with your own spectacle, right? We're going to have a brawl right after this. I didn't mention it. Um, how do you make sure yours stands out? I mean, you know, we've got a couple comic book originated movies and just, you know, big, a lot of sci-fi and fantasy. And how do you make sure, how, how do you approach that? How do you make sure that yours stands out? I think in the case of uh, Green Lantern, from the very beginning, we always sort of tried to discuss, well, what kind of genre is this if it's not a comic book movie? You know, how can it be, what, what genre kind of, you know, what does it fit in with? And for us, it was sort of always a fusion of, uh, of, of sort of a, a space opera mixed with, uh, you know, an action kind of adventure on Earth and uh, kind of fusing those two kind of films together. Um, you know, I can remember being a kid and seeing the ad for, sitting next to my dad and seeing the ad for Star Wars and saying like, I want to see that. And I can remember going to uh, Superman and coming home and just, you know, fastening, making anything yeah. I could into a cape, you know, <laughs> as quickly as I could and like down, you know, dashing around the house. And uh, to, you know, in, in a way, it's, it's just very rewarding to suddenly sort of be a part of something where you go, oh, okay, now we're kind of, we're melding those two worlds together, yeah. and we're trying to sort of do something that, uh, you know, and we hope that uh, some kid out there can have the same kind of experience that, that we had. But I, for us, it's always was always sort of, okay, well, let's not think about, like, it as a comic book film. Let's think about it as just a film, and, and what kind of film would it be? Right. How about you, Chris? I, you? Well, I think the only way to stand out is to not compete, you know, because if you're sitting there going, I'm doing Captain America, but I know they're making Transformers, so we ought to put some robots in, in here, and, you know, <laughs> You'll go nuts. So it's just, you know, this is a movie about this guy, Steve Rogers, and treat him as humanly as possible and make essentially a, a, a biopic about your main character and then hopefully it'll stand on its own as a, as a solid movie and then compete, uh, you know, on its own merits. Because, you know, you can't roll it out and say, it's going to have, a, you know, 90% more Matrix and, you know, 35% <laughs> Hangover, you know, it's just like, there are executives who would kill yeah, to Yeah, there are a lot of program Hangover that, but, elements in yeah. Captain oh, America. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he is actually drunk for about 90% of the movie. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's almost like you just can't think about it because it's, you know, you'll go insane. Hmm. Okay. You have a thought, Eric? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I mean, I, I would say that... Um, uh, you, you definitely have to be, you know, true to your mythology and your source material, and and, and, and whatever that is, um, be true to that. 
Uh, I do think if you had a group of, of directors here, they, they might have a little different opinion yeah. on the idea of, of standing out and, and competing because many of these movies uh, are greenlit based on now, based on kind of um, uh, pre-visualized sequences, animated sequences that are the uh, visual action sequences or, or, or moments that are really going to are designed to wow the audience, or really stand out in a in a trailer. When you have 30 seconds to advertise your movie on television, you have a two and a half minute um, uh, trailer. That uh, these sequences are very important because it is a, a, a visual medium, and you do have to. I think we all do when we are uh, we're trying to design sequences that fit our narrative. But I think there is a piece of our brains. And if there isn't, as soon as we're working with a filmmaker, um, <laughs> they're going to you know, be hammering that piece of our brains uh, about um, how is, what are we doing that hasn't been seen before? Mm -hmm. What are we doing that uh, somebody's going to see and, uh, on, on screen and say, uh, I've, that doesn't remind me of this picture, this picture, this picture. I've never seen that. I've never seen that image. Um, and... Uh, you know, whatever the scale of the movie, I think uh, we're all somehow aware that we need that um, in our in our picture. Right. Well, the last um, thing is our choices. You have to get back in touch with your inner fan. If you're, you know, if you're the we we have the luck of having grown up on a lot of this stuff and know a concept. I think we're there at, by, by merely saying yes to doing Green Lantern or to doing something. You are saying that stands out to me. Hopefully, if you have integrity. You know, <laughs> hopefully, if you're not just, you know, if you're really doing it because you're, if you're passionate about it. So it, it's got to, you got to for a minute be a kid looking at the concept that's presented to you and go, I want to see that. And if you don't want to see it, bad. If you want to see it, that's the first clue that it might stand out. Hopefully. Right. And I, I think as you go through the process, which is rigorous, you know, you go back to that feeling that you sort of started with a lot. And yeah. it's, it's an important question to kind of ask yourself because you do. You have to kind of so many times I think go back to that moment and go wait a second what do I want to see what do yeah. you know what would I wanted to see if I was you know when I was that age or what excites me about this you right know? and that's sort of what can kind of get you through the uh, the rewrites etc you know all the other things that come your way and I think also and it's almost the unique purview of the writer is connecting those big visuals to the emotional content um, you know. Uh, you can cut an action sequences. You can cut them together a billion different ways. You can conceive them a billion different ways. You can do whatever. But at the end of the day, you're still telling a mini story where a character starts in one place, he makes a choice, something happens, he makes another choice, he either succeeds or fails, there's a plot consequence, there's an emotional <laughs> consequence, you move forward. And, you know, those are the things that, that as a writer, I think you bring. Uh, more than almost anyone else, you know, because that's the, the fundamental structural choice. And if you're emotionally involved, if you're passionate about what you're writing, if you care about the characters, um, that's going to come through on the page. The actors are going to pick that up. The, the director is going to put that into his movie, and the audience is going to experience it. And, and I think, you know, if you're having an experience while you're writing it, if you can feel it, they will too. On the director's uh, issue, like many of you have worked with you know, pretty strong-minded, visionary guys, fa you know, Favreau, J.J. Uh, Abrams, Michael Bay, uh, Greg Berlanti. Uh, um, <laughs> you know, how do you manage those relationships? Because obviously, especially with these types of movies, to your point, Aaron, there, there are, you know, even more so trailer moments and yeah. visuals, and they're bringing things that have to be done. And in animation, you de obviously you're dealing with so many collaborations with, the artists, right? How do you manage those relationships in terms of what you're trying to bring to it and where those things maybe don't line up? Two hats. <coughs> Two hats. <coughs> <coughs> Two hats! <laughs> <laughs> Always try and act like, a, like you're one of the problem solvers, like a producer. You, you put on your producer hat and you put on your screenwriter hat. Even if you're not technically a producer on a movie, just do it. Act like it's, acknowledge that part of it is a business and then be able to be in the problems of the movie that sometimes extend beyond script that somehow that can can be attributed to script when they're not. It's it's other things. It's casting can be its own challenge that somehow affects how the script's being looked at. Depending on if another actor's coming in, you can easily t easily take it personally and go, 
on the right arm protecting this, that's all I'm protecting, but if you, if you take a broader view, then suddenly you're indispensable, not only as hopefully the writer, but as one of the problem solvers of whatever's coming up, you know, on something this size when you're dealing with a toy company or mm -hmm. uh, a studio that owns a property or sponsors, you know, become part of the solution and then, then you're going to be there, you know? Yeah. I think also dealing with the director, I generally go into it, I mean, maybe this is my natural self-deprecation, but I think he knows far more about the physical making of the movie than I do. You know, so Steve and I can sit there and dream up 8,000 action sequences where a tank, you know, flies off a cliff or something like this, and then there's this huge sort of moment where you sit down and you go, okay, I'm now with the guy who actually has to make a tank fly off a cliff. And if he tells me it would be easier to do this or that's not going to happen, I have to respect that because, like, you know, I have no fetters on me in front of the computer. It's just like, I can do whatever I want. But Joe Johnson comes up to me and says, you know, thanks for writing the scene where the guy lifts a tank and throws it, you know, <laughs> that's really gonna be great. <laughs> um, so there's, you know, you're hitting the, the, the physical world all of a sudden, and it's, it's pretty instructive. And a lot of the time, their, their thing is better than my thing because theirs actually can happen with the physics of the world, you know? So it's gonna hit you harder on the screen as opposed to a tank that weighs nothing and I can chuck it around and, you know, suddenly, sometimes the laws of physics are, are gone and you don't, you don't feel it when people get punched and things like that. But you get guys who know that they're going to have to have humans doing these things, ideally, half the time. Right. Uh, and it's, you know, sort of fascinating. Well, I guess there's fewer limits at this point, given that the, 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 what you can do with CGI and in yeah. animation, obviously, you have even fewer rules, right? I mean, you can... Well, you know, we can, I guess, theoretically do anything, but it's like any other production, and maybe even harder in some ways, because every single element has to be built. Mm -hmm. So you can have a scene and say, oh, you know, it'd be great, we need 10 people in the background. And in a live action movie, you could probably go get 10 people, have them stand there. We, we would have to create them and teach, someone has to design the skeleton that shows how they walk and <laughs> rigs them. And uh, it's actually very limiting in some ways because you can't, you don't have the resources, the time, the manpower or woman power to build all these sets and create all these characters. So you are somewhat limited in what you can do in kind of a cool way because it forces you to be more imaginative with what you have. And I think even in animation, probably for all of us, that. For me, the role of the writer isn't just the dialogue, although that's part of it. It's that these productions are so complicated, even in animation where we could have 300 people making the movie. And for the director, we saw our role, my partner and I, as to be there for her to remind her at any point, oh, well, the story point is this, that the emotion of the character is here. And even though you're dealing with these huge issues, I'll be there to just say, to kind of whisper, if. Here's what the character is thinking, because even in stuff you could see, we've had we had a scene where the color of the sky was a certain color, that was, it was beautiful, the most beautiful sky ever. But it made it seem like it was kind of ominous, and we were introducing these characters with this ominous sky, and the audience was a little confused because those are the good guys, but now I think they're the bad guys. We haven't met them before, so it was this a very long discussion about why should the sky be a different color? And in animation, you can. You can just change the color of the right. sky. It's not easy, yeah. uh, and it was a, but it was a, a very interesting discussion. Shows how the story and the artistry they all have to work together to communicate the emotion, and if they don't, you're working at cross purposes. Uh, um, you know, it's interesting because <coughs> I think uh, you, these these movies we get involved in the process sort of at different stages, but uh, sometimes. You could take, we could each sit down and, and if we had the luxury, go off for three months by ourselves and write a draft of one of these pictures. And usually we don't have that luxury at all. Mm. Um, but we could do that. And then uh, John Favreau could direct the movie, or Michael Bay could direct the movie, or Martin Campbell could direct the movie. And as we start to rewrite um, per that director's uh, vision, at the end of the process, you would have three scripts that no longer resemble uh, the, the original at, at all. Um, so at that point, our job is really to make sure we are serving the story best and defending 
the narrative and defending the emotional components of the narrative um, best while working with that filmmaker and what they want to create. Um, if I sit down with Michael Bay and, and say, you know what, I see this more as a Paul Greengrass sort of style <laughs> movie, you know, that's, I'm, that's the last sentence out of my mouth and I'm <laughs> out the door, right? So, uh, but <laughs> what, you know, what I, what I do know is that I'm gonna work with this director's very strong authorial vision and whatever I come up with for a, uh, for a set piece, um, he's going to inject with human growth hormone and, and make it something wilder than I, I could imagine. And that's, that's something that he does that uh, nobody else does the way he does. But at the point where he says, uh, I want to cut this sequence because I find it kind of boring, and it may be a sequence that I feel is critically important to, to uh, the emotional journey, then I have to stand my ground and I have to and I have to fight him you know and I have to say no no you can't cut it and this is why but I have to make my I have to make my case and how does that usually work out if I make my case well it works out right. is there a, do you have an example from Transformers 3 um well yes yeah, certainly there are uh you, you know, I, I, I have more examples from Transformers 2. <laughs> <laughs> well, in Transformers 2, we were locked in a hotel room for three months because the strike had just ended. Michael, it was five blocks from his office, so it was like me, Aaron, and Alex literally in a hotel room every day so we could drop by at noon, see what we had, take pages, and then go prep the movie because hmm. it's got to go shoot. You know, we, two weeks before the strike, we handed him a 30-page treatment that he went off, he turned it into 70 pages, he started prepping the movie and he got really, you know, because of the time constraints he was feeling, got totally, so. He got he, locked into. He, he got locked things. into the early stuff because he had to prep it. And many of those things, uh, it, under normal process, would have been considered sort of first draft. Totally. Uh, first draft outline, totally. in fact. And then suddenly you're locked into to some of those things. Um, and at, at, at that point it becomes very difficult to, and very expensive, to really try to rework sort of macro uh, ideas, added to which he was a bit cross about yeah, he us was, going on strike He blamed the us first for place. the strike, you know. Well, he actually obviously made a, made a particular comment recently about the second film. Do you guys want to take this opportunity? Like, how did you experience that? He said before, you know, it was unfair to all of us. Uh, you know, so I think it was, when a un, it was a really an untenable position yeah. uh, to be trying to prep, to put him in that position of, of to be trying to prep a movie of that scale, where six months out you have to commit to sequences and locations and and uh, uh, and the movie could have been pushed, but he always said because he's got a, he uses all the same people over and over for him. He kind of considers himself kind of a jobs program. And for him, the idea of pushing the movie means all these people that he considers to rely on him go down and, you know, they don't, they're in between jobs, et cetera, et cetera, and making the date for the studio. So on the one hand, uh, that's an amazing thing to get it out and actually have it succeed, you know? And so th it's not exactly like, oh, God, the whole thing was, I learned a lot from having that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I, I mean, I, I think, and, and, and maybe Bob, you'd agree, I think that movie is a good example of, um, and, and a lot of it was the time constraints, and a lot of it was reacting to um, people's feeling in the first movie. Wow, we, you, we want to see so much more of the robots and more of action. We just got a little taste of it. Um, <laughs> that I think that, that second movie was a little bit of an example of uh, assembling spectacles and trying to make the narrative work um, in, a, in a sort of connect the dots way, which is not the ideal way um, to, uh, to, to make one of these movies. Um, but he's so reasonable when he's not mad at you. you know? He's reasonable? Yeah, he's, he's great. You, he's you great. just fight and he'll pay attention. And <laughs> right. You have to fight, actually. I mean, the first time we sat down with him when we met him, his first question to us was, why should I trust you? On the first one or the second one? In the first movie, The Island. This is <coughs> Transformers 2 was the third yeah. one. The first time we met him, it was, why should we trust you? My answer was, well, you shouldn't yet. 
let's let's see what happens. You know, as long as you're honest and and not backing down from what you actually think, most people respect that. Right. Mm -hmm. How do you guys feel about uh, you know a lot of these types of movies tend to go through a lot of iterations and a lot of writers and. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that philosophically and practically when you're either coming on to something that other writers have worked on or, or the other writers come on after you? You know, how, how do you, uh, leaving maybe arbitration aside, for the moment, <laughs> uh, just that, you know, when you get the call, you have this job. Do yeah. you like? Do, you, do the other people know that I'm now writing this, and do yeah. you know that someone else is now writing it? Like, can you guys talk about that a little bit? Well, the best experiences I've had were, have been where you acknowledge each other. Like, if I'm coming on after the person, or we're coming on, I keep, keep eliminating yes. my imaginary writing partner. Uh, <laughs> like, w we did a rewrite on a movie a few years ago, and the previous writer sent us a nice email, said, I'm really glad you guys are on it. You know, we had a dialogue with him. And uh, we've now done the same thing when we've been rewritten. And it just makes you... Whether or not it affects what you're doing on the script, it makes you feel better that you're, you know, not being taken advantage of in some way, where it's just like, you know, you collaborate with people in the art department, or you co collaborate with the cinematographer, this is another guy you're going to have to collaborate with. I mean, it's not always, it's not delightful, you know, when someone, you know, goes, hey, guess what? We're I'm you dating know, your wife. We're <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Or it's like, hey, hey, guess what, you know, you guys did a great job. Now we're, we're you know, he's only going to change dialogue. And it's like, that's, you know, I don't care about any of the other parts of the script. I only like the dialogue, <laughs> you know. But it's, you know, it's such a natural part of the process by now, whether or not it's a, you know, incredibly pleasing one. Um, and then, you know, you can often find a way to slip back in the door when no one's looking and just take it all out again. So. <laughs> Well, you know, I think for us, and we've been through uh, a couple of different variations on this theme, um, and, and usually it's been under ridiculous time constraints, you know, so there's like no time to sort of call somebody and have a conversation, or you're coming into the project in a place where they've completely thrown out their idea of how they want to get into it and they want to start fresh, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think then, you know, your first responsibility is to ask two questions of uh, you're a producer, there's a director involved, your studio. Um, you know, the, the first question is, why am I here? You know, what about the material that existed in your mind isn't the movie that you wanted to make, right? You know, not how did it fail, you know, but you know, at, at what point did you realize that there's something about this that, that isn't working and we want to go through this process again? You know, because part of your job is, you know, you're, you're coming in to do a service, right? I mean, you're, you're an artist, you're a craftsman, you know, you, you take pride in your work, but you are also trying to help these people spend $150 million, <laughs> you know, and you have to look at it that way with that degree of responsibility and say, well, okay, what about the product is wrong to you? Um, and the second question is, you know, in your heart of hearts, you know, when you think about what this movie is, you know, what's the, what's the feeling you walk out of the theater with? Just experiencing it as an audience member, you know, what are you feeling from it? You know, um, what's that tone? Because the more you have that conversation, I, I think the more you can, you can lock into a person's pace and point of view um, and become a bit of a chameleon, which I think you have to be, you know, and TV teaches that like gangbusters. You want to be successful on TV, you've got to be a bit of a chameleon. You know, but still maintain your voice, right? That's the challenge. Um, and then the third question is, you call your agent and you say, okay, this is great. We just talked to these guys. We asked them these questions and stuff, and it's all very touchy-feely. But my question is, who am I actually working for? Mm. Right. Uh, you know, knowing who is actually in charge. And by the way, hmm. the answer to that question is always different because, first of all, they all think they're in charge. Secondly, <laughs> you know, sometimes it, it is the director. Mm. Sometimes it's the studio. And sometimes it's an incredibly powerful producer. And knowing who it is that has to be pleased, you know, it, it, I think is, is kind of key because that's the person that, that you really need to, to lock onto. And again, not in a sycophantic way, you know, but ultimately it's, it's their taste that's going to decide whether or not this is a movie. And again, you're spending $150 million, you know, 
be responsible to that. Speaking of all the people that have to be pleased, especially on these movies, you got in some cases comic companies, toy mm -hmm. companies, merchandisers, marketers, not to mention the studios. The military. The military. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, General General Bay's military. No, um, the, no, the, the United, United States. States. Yeah. No, I, no, no, right. No, I remember um, in the hotel one of the first. It was like we're gonna we'll start on Act One. You figure out where, which carrier group we need off the coast of San Diego. You know. <laughs> <laughs> You've all gotten that question, right? Uh, I mean, yeah, it's like, yeah. Actually, I right. actually have gotten that question in a different life, but uh, right. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, so how do you? What's the what's the funniest or oddest or most interesting specific? example of that interaction that you've gotten. I remember a writer who was w working on an animated film and she had to create a character because they had a plush toy. We need another plush toy. It was totally driven by merchandising. Mm -hmm. To what extent has that actually played into the writing and developing of the script? There's so much arcana and so much detail in the mythology of something like the Green Lantern. It's like, you know, he gets his superpowers from a ring, which he gets from a lamp, which he gets from a bigger lamp, you know, Martin used to say. It's like, <laughs> like you know, and so try explaining that to the audience in the first 20 minutes. And, uh, and so, uh, so the best you can sort of do, I think, throughout is sort of go, okay, well, what would I want to see and what would I, you know, do? And it applies to the, I think, any of the elements in terms of like where and how something like DC was, you know, involved. Right. In Transformers uh, 2, we had to throw in the Chevy Volt, right? <laughs> The Chevy Volt came middle of the process, uh, and actually, I had someone had asked me on one of the websites that I talked back on. You know, hey, did did you have to put the Chevy Volt in in the middle? At the, and I said, yeah, we had to stuff them in there. And I guess someone got an angry call from the car company that the writer had said that we had to stuff the Volt in there, <laughs> which, which I apologize. And then we also had to get that giant rail gun. You said it again. Just yeah. talk. Yeah. I just said it again. And then the rail gun that we had to get in, where the military's got this new gun that can shoot a projectile. 100 miles off the coast, so now we have to get, make sure that wherever we are in Egypt, it's close enough on the coast that the, the rail gun can hit the thing at the top of the pyramid. You know, come on. So that, and that's us. something the military brought to the table. They're like, can you, can we you got work? We new rail gun that we really like. Advertise our yeah, company. well, no, but that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. that, it's insane. John, do you run? Is you, know, you, you would think because we're animated that there, there are plush toys come to life, there would be that pressure. And it's very much, tell the best story, make the characters resonant and their problems and what they're going through. And yes, it's a little strange to see a panda who exists in ancient China in a commercial for Happy Meals. But, and, and my partner and I will get the scripts and help punch up Poe's jokes in the McDonald's ads. And it isn't like, oh, we're selling out. It's, we want people to see our movie. And that's how kids and their parents find out about these movies. And there's nothing wrong with advertising your movie as long as you feel like you're not selling out your characters too much and you're still being true to them and still delivering a promise of, you have to come through on your promise. You can't have toys and ads that promise an experience that you then don't deliver. Bob, you mentioned, I know you interact uh, with the fans uh, to some extent. Uh, almost all of you guys are working on properties that have pretty fervent, uh, like deep source material and fervent fan base. To what extent does that, can that influence you and to what extent do you engage with that pros, pro and con? <laughs> I think you have to start as a fan. I, I think that, look, um, the nice thing about working for, for Marvel, right, on Thor, when we walked in there and sat down with them, was that we never had to explain to them what was cool about Thor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? We knew. Um, you know, I was a kid, I collected Thor like crazy. I have the entire Walt Simonson run on Thor. I have my opinions as a fan, right? <laughs> other fans have their opinions. You know, I either agree with them or I don't, you know, but, but you, have to, you have to come to it uh, that way, you know. And, and yeah, you know, there's, there's always going to be people who love the same things that you love a character and, and don't love things, you know, that you do. It's, you know, for me, for example, uh, with Thor, they just released a one minute clip and it's cool and it's Thor and he's going to get his hammer and he fights this gigantic shield agent in the mud and there's a cameo uh, <laughs> of somebody, I don't know who it is, but he's got a bow. Um, and, um, that was a surprise to Marvel, by the way. We just threw that in the script to see what they would say, and they flipped. Um, but uh, I saw that, and I was like, yeah. When we were writing that movie, and, and when I was a kid, and I experienced that character, 
that's who he was. He was that guy. He was the guy that even without his hammer, if you stuck him in a room with 50 other guys, he's walking out alive, you know, and they're all dead behind him. You know, it's just, that was, that was who he was to me. And so, you know, seeing fan reaction to material like that is always interesting because some people go, wow, that's exactly what I think he is. And other people say, mm, what? You know, and, and I think X-Men has been, uh, been very much the same way. I mean, that's a, that was a, a different experience with Fox in terms of the, the development process. But at that point, you're five movies in. You know, they know what X-Men is. And by the way, you're working with Brian Singer, who you know, really created that franchise and, and made it what it is. And you're, you're talking to him in the context of, of what he's built. And you know, it, for us, it was something that we loved. So that was an easy conversation to have. Um, and, and honestly, the most difficult thing in terms of watching fan reaction to things is that the fans have, uh, they have a relationship with the source material, and they have a relationship with the film material. And, uh, you know, the reality is that you're mainly trying to please, you know, or service the film material uh, less than the comic book material. That stuff is still important. I'm a big X-Men fan, you know, but at the end of the day, you've also created a world and a universe and you have to be consistent. You know, you have to be true to that. And, and their opinions obviously affect your box office, but they can't affect the, the creative choices that you make. What about in your case, you know, you're basically attempting to launch a franchise. Right. You know, you don't have the, the previous film material. Well, I'd also say the other part about it was it's the comic book itself has, has changed a lot since I was a kid, you know, like so the first thing is, you know, I mean, maybe I stopped reading, you know, a little bit later than I'd admit, you know, but, <laughs> but, uh, but exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, but there were, there were actually other Green Lanterns and whole other stories and other aliens and other, you know, uh, things that had kind of uh, come into play. So first you do a bit of research about that, but I, I think it's the, it, the same is true. It's just, you know, you always want to be true to sort of like, okay, we're, we're telling a story here first. And, um, and hopefully, if we're fortunate enough and we get to do a second one of these things, we won't have to explain all of this mythology again uh, to this degree uh, because there's, there's you know, so much of it. But that's also what separates it and makes it interesting and makes it, uh, you know, uh, makes it uh, exciting in its own right. So well, you've got someone's two. always going to say to you in Green Lantern 2, Right. We need to explain know, what yeah, happened for the people who right. didn't yes, see the yes. first one, and then you say, "Well, who's seen Green Lantern two? Who hasn't seen Green Lantern one?" But <laughs> right. that's the it happens with Panda. I'm sure it happens with every sequel I've ever done. Well, I'm curious. I mean, but, but these days, there's such an ex fans have such an expectation yeah. of access to you guys and the movies, and their demands met, and the studios now pay more attention to that than they used to, which means you probably get more pressure from that, and you probably are all ended up down at Comic Con walk in those hallways, uh, you know, surely you've run into some, you know, fans who have some comments or criticisms about oh, yeah. you. I mean, so how does that? I think if you know you respect the material, you know, you have that, you hide it away, you keep it inside you and, you know, <laughs> then you deal with whatever comes. You know, I've gone on the internet, especially with the Narnia movies where you have these, you know, very fervent for various reasons People. Why what what, what reasons? Why did you go on the internet? Uh, yeah, because why, why the only alternative was writing. And they're on the same machine. <laughs> you know, and one of them is way more entertaining. Um, and you go on there and they'll, somebody will say like, I can't believe they're doing this. And uh, you, know, I'll, you know, get kind of angry. And then I'll realize more than likely my day has just been ruined by a 10 year old, you know? <laughs> Bob, what's your experience been with like Comic Con, and you know, you you wade into those waters quite a bit. I think what's your motivation? I think screenwriters have become more visible than they've ever been, and I think screenwriters is in the minds of many kind of the the most realistic or accessible entry point to to having the dream come true of coming and working here, because you don't, you know none of us have to look like a movie star to do it. You just have to have a good idea, and you have to be able to work hard. And so I think I personally like transparency. I like to try and explain as much about the process as possible. And some people, by the way, don't like that. Some people don't like to see how the sausage is made at all. You know, you tell them that some plot decision came out of wherever it came from, that even if you think it works great. And some people can't handle the truth, you know? <laughs> <laughs> they think uh, it all has to be, I'm gonna go in an ivory tower and I'm not gonna be seen for three months. And when you see smoke come out of the top, the script is done, you know? <laughs> That's not how it works every time. Uh, not every time. Not every time. So, I, 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 to me, it's just it's 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 a little bit of uh, it is a little bit of proving you're a fan. 
and you only do it on the properties where you, you, you like you said, have the true respect because they can smell it otherwise. Yeah. Um, and you know, Lyndon Johnson used to make sure that whenever anyone wrote him a letter, his staff wrote a letter back the next day within 24 hours. And so there is a bit of just politics to it. If you can, as many hands as you can shake, mm -hmm. that's, that's not nothing. Mm. Um, and, I, and, I, and, it, and it can affect a creative decision, hearing uh, uh, a fan's response, but it can affect, as you said, the translation to live action or whatever it is that you're doing. I mean, at, at, uh, at the scale of these, these movies that, that we're talking about, our, our job is not really to appease existing fans so much as it is to create new fans mm. um, because if you know Greg is is writing uh, a movie that is going to speak only to men and women who have ever purchased a Green Lantern comic book he's dead right he's dead the movie's dead um, he's got to be uh, true to that mythology and respect that that mythology but he's got to find the universal um, themes in it and some new sort of visual adventure that is, is going to um, make people who have never heard the words Green Lantern before in their lives interested in um, learning about this, uh, this story. I mean, I, Hopefully you don't feel that pressure. <laughs> oh, yeah, Jesus, Jesus Christ! Now. Sit down. Give the guy a break. <laughs> but I, I mean, I think one of the you're dead. You're, you're dead. dead. Screw it. Okay, you're dead. Dead. Film is dead. Actually, <laughs> same with Thor. You're dead. You're dead. Um, you hung on the tree of war. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, it's a campaign. You know, you gotta. You can't. You have to. The base has to be happy, but you don't win the campaign without right. without getting independence. You know, Favreau, that's, that's what Favreau says. You know, I, I mean, I don't. In, in, in that respect, I don't, I don't think um, we approach writing a big summer movie any differently than we approach writing a small independent movie. I mean, the fact that someone's spending $200 million on it or $10 million on it doesn't really change our process at all. It just changes the level of client pa services. Of, of palace intrigue. <laughs> you know? yeah. Palace intrigue. <laughs> yeah. uh, wait, sorry. Oh, I was going to ask. A question, because I think if you're talking about the rabid fan base and the the bigger thing, when you were talking about Transformers, I'm going to synthesize <laughs> and say I, when we talk about a movie is successful, there are different definitions. You talked yeah. about how Transformers too, because of the strike, there was disappointment. I think if you looked at the box office, not a single person was disappointed in its results. So I always feel like I don't want to be the guy who you have a movie come out and it does huge, and then oh, great movie, really. Man, they made some choices in the second act that I didn't agree with at all. And the person looks at you and says, what do you, I, I don't care. There's so many movies where people have said, that was the greatest movie I've ever seen. The story sucked and the dialogue was terrible. Well, what a great movie. Yeah. <laughs> because people bring, they, they want different things out of movies. And sometimes the things we want to bring aren't necessarily what people want yeah, right on. to find. Yeah. It's not what they're looking for. It's part of it, definitely. but. If you're looking to be entertained, does that mean you really care about that character's speech in Act Two, or the yeah. the thing that was so important to the theme? Eh, maybe you just go past it because they want to get to the next explosion, and that's that's not right or wrong. It's yeah. it's sort of it it comes and it yeah, goes. So yeah. I mean, what do you think of like the, when you're making those? The dialogue sucked, but the air conditioning was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you what do you said at the word entertaining? Above all, it has to be entertaining. That's I mean, talk about. That's the one thing we left out of the summer movie uh, definition. It just has to, if it's entertaining, every, all else is uh, a little bit secondary. You know? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's hard for, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it's hard to say work on a movie like Transformers 2, right? Which sort of has a reputation, but it wasn't a great movie. And yet w we've had the experience of sitting in the theater and have, hearing a whole, 500 person theater you know, cheer and laugh and walk out of the, the movie theater and happy with their uh, $10 uh, expenditure for those two and a half hours. Um, so uh, I, on, on that scale, you know, I'd look at me like that and say, it entertained. Yeah, mm -hmm. honestly yeah, speaking, yeah. as a fan, you, you know, in terms of just the Transformers, right? It, little things can make a huge difference. The voice of Optimus Prime. I mean, 
holy shit. Whenever he says, Autobots, roll out, I'm just like 12 years old and weeping, you know? Um, Optimus Prime dies, like, in Transformers 2, and I'm like, ah, uh, you know? And uh, I'm waiting for, like, the cool rock and roll song to start, a different <laughs> version of the movie. Um, but, you know, you respond to those things, you know? And it's like you said, you know, the audience isn't walking out of the theater saying, it's like, you know, when Optimus Prime and Bumblebee were having tea, you know, together and, you know, Mary and thought, then, and they were having that conversation, it really made me think about my place in this world. It, those conversations don't happen. And you know what? Those conversations are kind of bullshit because those conversations are up here. They're all intellectual. You know, going to the movies is an emotional experience. And if you're entertained, it's because you're brought into that world and because, you know, there's, there's something that, that carries you into it, you know, and, and later you can say, wow, you know, I really appreciate, you know, that conversation in Marienbad between Optimus Prime and Bumblebee. You know, in, in, in reflection, but in the moment, you shouldn't be there. That's not entertaining. Speaking <coughs> of fandom, uh, <coughs> I, I'd love to hear what your, you know, from, from your childhood, the summer movie that, you know, just really stands out for you and that stuck with you either as inspiration or you just fucking mm -hmm. most entertaining movie you've ever seen. And to go along with that, if there are any <coughs> favorite uh, sequences or, um, lines of dialogue or exchanges that go along with that. Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, I, I don't believe I'd ever thought of a bullwhip at all prior to seeing that. And afterwards I came home and I, I think I literally made my own whip, which is a little kinky for a 12 year old. <laughs> but um, yeah, that movie was everything I wanted in a movie and had no idea I wanted it beforehand. I just like came out like, that was the greatest thing I've ever seen. And Joe Johnston, who directed Captain America, worked on that movie, which is another reason it's really hard to argue with him when he says, I'd like the action sequence to go like this, and you realize he actually storyboarded that truck chase in Raiders <laughs> Lost Ark. You're like, okay, you can, you can have what you want, Joe. I got that sequence, I guess, and every other sequence in that movie is just. I'd say uh, The Empire Strikes Back, mm. although that's, in some sense, that's in retrospect. Um, because at the time that I saw it, it freaked me out. It scared the ever-loving crap out of me. Um, and it was the first time I'd had that experience in the theater. And so when I walked out of it, I thought, oh, I didn't like that. But actually, I loved it. Um, although strangely, you know, the, the sequence from a summer movie that I, I best remember comes from Return of the Jedi. I know I sound like a Star Wars fan, and I'm, mm -hmm. I am, but I'm not, that's not my Ooh, primary you fandom. Um, you know, it's, it's actually, it's the scene, uh, you know, where Luke has just followed Yoda's advice and, you know, not used his anger, <laughs> and he's just gotten his ass handed to him by Darth Vader, right? You know, and Darth <laughs> Vader and the Emperor are talking, they're having tea, the Marion bot, and, um, you know, the Emperor's like, screw it, he's got a sister, right? And Luke flips out, and he goes, straight at Darth Vader. He does everything that Yoda tells him not to do, right? <laughs> and just, it's huge and it's epic and it's emotional and that score is amazing and it's just, you, you realize it's for all the marbles and it makes you forgive the Ewoks. And uh, it, you know, it, it, I think it's one of those things, <laughs> one of those moments that, that gives that, that series its immortality. You took mine, you took Raiders straight from me. <laughs> was Die Hard a summer movie? It was. Die Hard too. 40 stories. I mean, Die Hard also. <laughs> Die Hard too was a little, that was summer, I remember. Uh, I just remember back in the day of the singleplex, where in my town I would, I think it was Raiders, Big, Die Hard, where you'd watch the movie and then you'd say, I'm staying, I'm gonna watch it again. And I remember watching those movies twice and uh, now I would sneak into another movie with, with the multiplexes. But back then, those were the first movies I remember going, everything about this was just spoke to me and I wanted to see again. Was there any particular sequence that stands out to you or, or a line of dialogue? You know, you look back at Raiders and I just feel like it's, it's just so perfect. Things that are set up are paid off from a, like a craft perspective and, and sequences that the characters change throughout them. I, of course, I love one of my favorite, maybe this is a Raiders goof, is the, in the beginning where they're drinking, she's saying, proceed, proceed, whatever it is, and she's slamming it down, and 
and then she drinks and she's almost going to pass out. And then as soon as it's done, she's fine and she's cleaning up. And <laughs> maybe, maybe it was a con, but uh, even as a kid, I remember thinking, that's weird. How does that happen in a movie? <laughs> because she was drinking and then she's <laughs> like, I don't think I put together that it's an actress and she shot that scene and then that scene. And they were very different. It may have been three days apart. It was just like, she's drunk and now she's sober. That, she's an incredible person. <laughs> now I know. I saw you tea at a drive-in with my parents and my brother, amazing, and then the summer that Back to the Future, mm. and it was oversold, and I actually had to sit in the aisle to watch it. it was actually the greatest thing ever. I mean, I, I remember becoming aware of summer as a time for movies, you know? You? Um, <coughs> I can remember going to see uh, Jaws 3D, uh, <laughs> a, and uh, I think sitting in the front row, and watching the picture, and, and thinking, I don't know. I, I think maybe I could do a little better than this. I, 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 should, I should look into this. How do you how do you get into this business? And in 3D. <laughs> and in 3D. Um, I, 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 I think uh, there are certainly summer movies um, that I've seen 20 times, you know, Back to the Future or, or Gremlins or Aliens or, or Raiders. Um, and there are equally great movies like Gandhi that I've seen once. Um, and it wasn't a summer movie. Right? <laughs> so I think there's, what there's something, <laughs> there's, there's something, there's just something about the, 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 uh, the, the roller coaster ride of some of these, these movies that um, are, are escapist and, and make you want to repeat that that journey and, and uh, the sense of wonder to them. Um, and, uh, you know, when we are able to capture that, you know, you're left with something that's, that uh, lasts for a long time and people watch over and over. And that's, that's the goal. What about you, Greg? Um, I, you know, I mentioned some of mine earlier, but the, uh, my birthday is May 24th, which is always around Memorial Day weekend, so I would get out of school for the day and get to go see whatever the first big, usually, uh, and it was Empire, obviously, was a big one. And, uh, uh, and then in the middle of the summer, I, I think the two ones that pop into my mind beyond uh, Superman, like I mentioned, and, and Star Wars were, were Empire, uh, and uh, just because it was, so many things were happening that uh, I didn't expect. And uh, I remember going to uh, the next day and going to school and saying, I want to write a, uh, a, a, an editorial in the stool, school newspaper about how this movie just changes every, uh, you know, d does all these things you don't, you don't expect. And, uh, and still to this day I think about it, you know, in terms of like, you know, uh, Luke does the thing he's supposed to not do and, and he loses, you know, and, uh, and, and it just it sort of kept uh, going to these dark uh, kind of places. And uh, I, I remember a lot of times the, the line between, uh, I love the exchange before Han Solo steps into the carbonite, you know, I love you and I know, which was like the coolest response ever to I love you uh, at the time. Uh, and so, uh, and, and, and the other movies I remember from the summer, at least this one I remember from the summer is, is, was, was Rocky III. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when he fights Clubber Lang. And it was in the <laughs> summer, and I just remember like getting up, yeah, standing right. up out of my seat and cheering uh, in, the final, uh, in the final fight. And a lot of times I'll still go back. I mean, the Rocky movies, you know, they always, there's, a lot of times we're, we're working on a story sequence and we'll say, is this Rocky 1? Are we doing Rocky 2? Are we doing Rocky 3? <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, does he get his comeuppance? Or is he coming for the comeback? Or does he just want to stay in the ring? You know, <laughs> so like you, you think they, they have a, they really imprint on you. Uh, and lasts with you your your whole life, and so uh, those those are the those are the films. Yeah, there's a screenwriter that points out that that Rocky's an amazing script because at the two third point, right in the third act, he basically says, "I can't win." Right. <laughs> yeah. He watches the footage and he says he realizes I can't win. Yeah. Like, and then there's a whole third act, and you just That's uh, right. like it totally changes what that movie's about. So anyway, um, do you guys tell the truth? Do you actually look at the box office that first weekend? Of yeah. course. Yeah. Oh yeah. Why wouldn't you? <laughs> Uh, you know, we well, because it could be a, an un, uh, you know, an unpleasant experience. Oh, hasn't happened. <laughs> so lucky, but that's that's the whole reason. That's the ex the excitement. Yeah, just it'll it'll happen. Believe me. But the DreamWorks is is great because there's anticipation building, and then you get a call from Jeffrey Katzenberg's assistant saying. <laughs> What's the number where you'll be reachable this weekend? And then at some point of the weekend, your phone rings and it says, call our ID, Jeffrey Katzenberg. Hello, boys. We, and then it's a whole thing about how wonderful everything is. I'm sure uh, you could also get the call that says, little disappointed. We think yeah. Sunday matinee is going to pick up. But 
again, what we're talking about is wanting to reach people. So it isn't about how much money the movie's made. It's about, oh my, millions of people went to see something you spent all your time on and enjoyed it, hopefully, and are telling their friends to go see it. And that's, yeah. that's the reward. I can go, even if, that's what I like to know. I like walking into a theater and watching people watch the movie because that's what it's about. You're trying to see, are they laughing at the things you thought were funny? Are they enjoying the things? Are they scared by the things that you were hoping were scary? Because if they're not, and, it, and the movie's not doing well, you just feel, you feel disappointed, like you haven't delivered what you were hoping to. Well, it's career, I mean, I know it's not about the, how much money it makes, but it's also career yeah. related too. I mean, if you, you, you can get in, in trouble, right? Although with these movies, do you feel like, do you feel like it's different with these types of movies, tentpole summer movies for writers in terms of who gets the blame? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you get the blame even when it worked. <laughs> right. That's when it's really tough. I track it. I track the stuff uh, more of as a student of the process and just wanted to be know as much as possible. How does information come in in real time? Who tracks it? How you know you? Just in case you want to be in the way or to spin whatever the psychological um, uh, Monday morning uh, take home is going to be. You, I just want to know everything that I can. You know, even though. Sometimes you're not in the mood to do it. Sometimes you don't want to, even, even in success, you might not, you don't, you want to not be looking at numbers and not high-fiving yourself if things are going, you know, you, it's a strange time for sure. It's not like nothing's happening. You're, you're, well, you know, so many other people yeah. are looking at that right. number too, and yeah, I just, right. I don't know how you. I want to know, like, Monday or Tuesday how it did. Like, Friday, throughout the weekend, I just wanted like, I have a movie on it. It's got my name on it. It's a good idea. Like, I remember, <laughs> I think it was the second Narnia, which, you know, much like, uh, Transformers 2 made a crap load of money, <laughs> but it's notoriously the, you know, the, uh, the failed franchise killer. Um, Steve called me up on, uh, I think, Saturday morning. So it's movie's been out, I don't know, 12 hours, and he goes, we're underperforming. <laughs> like, oh, fucking ruined my weekend. <laughs> so it's like, you know, I'll, you know, I'll get back to business on Monday, but I kind of just, you know, it's so out of my hands. Why should I now screw myself up emotionally for a few days doing this? But you look. Yeah. Do you ever, do you guys ever write scenes into a script that you know aren't going to be in the movie? I remember you yeah, I'm, I'm telling sorry. me about one. Yeah. You wrote a scene. For William Shatner, uh, at the end of the movie, where Spock, played by Leonard, gives his young self, played by Zach Quinto, uh, something he kept with him, and it was basically a recording of Kirk singing "Happy Birthday" to him for the last time before he went off to die in Star Trek VI. And uh, well, we didn't think it was, think JJ had determined early on that he he felt it might seem like it was a too small, and pandering to the fans a bit. But we wrote it anyway because as a fan, you know, you're always trying to protect that thing and. I want to be able to look fans in the eye and say we were ready if something had changed or if we felt that if William Shatner would have accepted a, essentially a cameo. Um, so yeah. So there was also a birth scene too, wasn't there? Didn't you say there was a like a? Uh, but we shot that. So you did shoot that. Didn't okay. know that that wouldn't be in the movie. Okay. You know? yeah. um, I mean, certainly we, we write scenes uh, that sometimes we hope will not be in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, part of, I mean, part of our <laughs> part of our Please job. Please explain. Well, part of our job is is uh, sometimes we, we'll receive notes um, from mm. producer, studio exec, director, actor, whoever, and uh, uh, um, you know, I, I may think, well, I don't think this is going to work, but I can't just as a as a member of a collaborative. I can't. Well, I'm not going to try that. I, it's not going to work, guys. Just trust me, it's not going to work. I have to have Guys, faith. let me do a bad job of this to prove to you well, that it's not going to work. Well, mm -hmm. I'm going to try to execute what you're asking me to execute. And I'm going to show it to you. And I'm going to have faith that you're going to review it and understand why I said, I don't think this is going to work. And here's going to be the problems with it. But I know you're not really going to believe me necessarily <laughs> until you read it and see for yourself. Yeah. And when the process works, Everyone agrees, oh yeah, but I'm glad we tried it. Because now we see what that was, we're not going to use that, we're going to do this yeah. instead. Sometimes we'll say, yeah, that's what we were, what we were looking for. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> but that's, I mean, it's really rare. It's really rare. Greg, you had a... I was going to say, like, a lot of these guys here have done some work on some uh, other films where there's been other writers, and you come in at a different 
point and you, you aren't sure who the person is you're writing for. Are you writing for the director? Are you writing for the producer? Are you writing for the studio exec? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so I'll rather than write one scene 15 different times, because that's exhausting and not fun, I'll write a few different versions of the scene and let them duke it out amongst themselves, yeah. knowing two of those things aren't whatever, but it's, that's expedited the time that I have to spend <laughs> on trying to sort of please four different voices you know, to, to fit it all into one scene can be such a hodgepodge that you're not proud of, you know, uh, that it's, it's easier, I think, to isolate different points of view yeah. and sort of do it that way. And that maybe, you know, speeds up the process of, of everybody having to sort of make up their minds collectively about what they want from that part, part of the film. Uh, we're going to wrap up, but I have one last question if you can ask, answer briefly. Um, obviously, so many, there's so much input in these movies uh, in addition to yours. How do you ultimately measure the value of your own contribution when you see the finished product? I mean, obviously, films are collaborative regardless, but these movies have so much push and pull on them. How do you, when you, when you go and you see the final cut, how do, you, how do you process that in terms of your contribution? I always think of it as like a band, and we mm. put out a great song. <laughs> and maybe you played the guitar, maybe you played the drums, maybe you, uh, maybe you were drums, and you sang like Phil Collins. <laughs> Um, you like to think of yourself as <laughs> Phil Collins when your movie comes out? He's awfully bitter these days. So you might want to pick a different. Yeah. Anyway, but anyway, I, I like the music analogy because you know, on you know, Cowboys and Aliens, that was we got Ron Howard, Spielberg, Grazier, John Favreau directing it, three studios and Paramount, Universal, DreamWorks. So it, it's I guess that's an orchestra, right? And uh, yellow. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you, I, I don't know if we're on Panda, I worked on it maybe four years, so I'll watch it and say, hey, that line's really funny, where'd that come from? And then I'll look back, oh, I wrote it three years ago, or someone else wrote it, that I, th these things are so collaborative that it gets to the point where, and if it's a good collaboration, you don't even know who brought what to it. We have our director, Jen, who, and our producer, Melissa, who are kind of at the head of it, and then there's all these people contributing and working together, and. I think at the end when no one can actually say that was mine and that was yours and it's kind of a that was ours, that's, that's the ultimate for, for our yeah. movies. I mean, I think if it doesn't, frankly, if I can't find myself or if it doesn't feel like they're saying written lines, if, it's a, if I can watch it like a movie and be entertained and no longer think about, oh, I remember writing that scene or I remember, then, then I've done my job. Because my job is not to be there. Um, so if it's, yeah, if I can sit there and forget I worked on the movie, perfect. Usually in a positive way, hopefully. Yes, yes well, right. no, I mean, there have been times where, <laughs> due to a blow to the head, I forgot. <laughs> right.